want a war, you're gonna get one. Now get the guns the drugs to my generation. I'll take the fall, the saints, and the cross of nations. And it's a saint, the gods, the fakes, the cross, the master of the great gold. Go, 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 let's get to the music. Play that fucking music. Listen to my music, Another week, another episode of Reliving the War, by God. It's the 23rd of June 1997, WWF Raw's on the USA Network and the show comes from Detroit, Michigan. WCW Nitro's on TNT and that show comes from Macon, Georgia. No big updates this week guys, I've appealed the copyright claims on the King of the Ring and Revenge of the Taker videos, so they should be visible again on YouTube while the WWE make a decision. You won't need to go to Patreon to watch the free versions if you don't want to. That being said, anytime one of my videos gets hit with claims, I'll make it free on Patreon as soon as possible, so always check over there if you can't view a video here. It sucks balls, I know, but at least it keeps the videos public. Alright, let's get started. Episode 89 of Reliving the War. A Nation of Domination promo's gonna run for 10 minutes on Raw and in that same time frame, Nitro puts on two promos and a match. So let's breeze through the Nitro stuff first of all. DDP comes out to cut a promo with Mean Gene Okerlund. Gene says the tag match is official, Savage and Hall vs DDP and a surprise partner at the next pay per view. Page says he loves surprises, he loves surprises at Christmas and he loves surprises on his birthday. And Dallas has a surprise for Hall and Savage at Bash at the Beach and DDP can't wait to see their faces. Kimberly doesn't like surprises, so she phoned up JJ Dillon during the week and she got Dallas a match against Scott Hall tonight on Nitro. The match gets officially announced during this promo, and that match is gonna main event tonight's episode. We then get a tag team match, Leparka and Damien vs Public Enemy. And check it out, there's your dad getting down with the Public Enemy. And here's your stoned uncle who has the ultimate wrestling videotape collection. As always, there's good energy for Monday Nitro, they've done a fantastic job of hyping up the crowd before going live. It's a short opening match here where Leparka and Damien didn't really work well together as a team, yet they still scored a victory, you could say this was an upset. Flyboy Rock o Rock put Damien through a table and Damien just vanished upon impact, that looked good. And while this was happening, Leparka smacked Johnny Grunge with a chair. Leparka wins the match for his team by pinfall afterwards. You could skip this one and miss nothing really, but WCW using the public enemy to open up their shows wasn't a bad idea. They do a good job of getting the crowd involved during their entrance. Another promo followed, this time with Eddie Guerrero. Mean Gene explains that Eddie's torn pectoral muscle put him on the sidelines for longer than expected, yet he had an opportunity to make a big comeback last week to wrestle Dean Malenko, and Eddie didn't take it. Instead, Eddie sent his nephew Chavo to the ring to wrestle the Iceman. Eddie says it was Chavo who offered to wrestle Dean, and to prove that, Eddie brings Chavo out. Chavo says he wouldn't exactly say he offered to wrestle Malenko last week, but Eddie interrupts him, saying that there's a big opportunity for Chavo this week if Chavo wants to take it. Eddie Guerrero vs 6 is supposed to happen tonight for the Cruiserweight title, and Eddie says he's already ran it past JJ Dillon and Chavo can take Eddie's spot. It is for the Cruiserweight title, so Chavo can't say no, but he's also a little pissed off that his uncle is making him do his dirty work. Over on Raw, the new nation comes to the ring, everyone wants to know why Ahmed joined his biggest enemy last week and, well, we get answers. Ahmed says the fans didn't get behind him for a WWF title shot when he came back from injury. He also says Vince McMahon wasn't going to give him a shot at the belt and even though McMahon says Johnson was gonna get an opportunity, Ahmed isn't buying it. The only people who had Ahmed's back were the crew, the boys, the fucking lads, the nation of domination. Dilo has a few things to say and keep an eye on Kama and Farouk, they're like, what the fuck's going on, why is he talking? 
Dilo says the people turned their back on Ahmed and Vince McMahon turned his back on Ahmed and that's why he joined the nation. Basically Dilo's our little recap guy, thanks Dilo. Farouk says the most feared threat in the world today is seeing powerful intelligent black men getting together for one cause and that's what the WWF is gonna see with the new nation. Dilo gives us another recap and then Ahmed tells Vince McMahon to never cross his eyes at the nation again or he'll wish he was never born. Cross his eyes? I mean, okay yeah whatever. Kama said he's proud of beating The Undertaker last week, he's proud of the nation and he's proud of Ahmed Johnson, the man who's gonna beat The Undertaker and prove that the nation are champions. So we assume Ahmed vs Taker is gonna take place at Canadian Stampede. Here comes 4 biker dudes who clearly aren't overcompensating for anything at all. Crush is here and it looks like he's brought some of his hard biker mates. Crush gets in the ring and he says he didn't get fired from the nation, he actually quit and he introduces the DOA, dirty old assholes. Crush says the DOA is a real brotherhood, they live together, they ride together, they do each other's laundry and they also fight together. The nation and the DOA then have a big old brawl and welcome to WWF Raw for the rest of the year because these gang wars just keep going on and on. If you want the condensed version, the DLO recap version, check out my video on the subject. Security and officials break up the fight, the dirty old assholes leave on their little motorbikes, let's move on. Alex Wright vs Chris Jericho on Nitro and we've got Rockabilly vs Shamrock on Raw. Dan motherfucking Severn is sitting at the commentary desk, Severn of course had some history with Kenny Boy including two UFC fights, one at UFC 6 where Shamrock made Severn top and another pretty controversial one at UFC 9 which Severn won by split decision. Closed fists and headbutts were banned by the district attorney of Michigan during this one but the guys were apparently told behind closed doors that their fines would be minimal and they could pretty much ignore the ruling. This led to confusion and it led to the fight being awful but not gonna get into all that now. Seeing Dan motherfucking Severn in the WWF, the reigning NWA world heavyweight champion, was very interesting though. Shamrock destroys Rockabilly, our guitar playing glue bag has to reach for the ropes a few times when Ken goes for submissions, Billy got one shot at a little offense and he didn't make the most of it, Ken hits the belly to belly and Rockabilly tops out to the ankle lock. Ken squares up to Dan motherfucking Severn afterwards and they shake hands. McMahon says there's mutual respect between these two but that's not what we came to see, we want to see them fight. Fuck yeah, Saturday night fever gives me a funny feeling in my pants. Two. Oh, big bloodlust. Ah, the rematch of the century, Jericho wants some revenge because Alex Wright beat him fair and square a few weeks back. Wright attacks early and Jericho goes down with a shoulder block. A little hip action from Wright makes the girls and a few guys squeal with delight. Shoulder block 2 gets Jericho all frustrated, so Chris hits a spinning wheel kick and Wright gets sent over the top rope with a clothesline. Alex threatens to leave the match but he comes back for more. He applies a wrist lock and I wonder if anyone has actually submitted to a wrist lock. If not, someone should. Jericho hits a suplex, he applies an armbar but Wright performs a headstand counter. Jericho begins firing up but the commentators don't care, they're talking about the Impact player who debuts next week on Nitro and they wonder if this mystery superstar could be DDP's tag partner at Bash at the Beach. Wright drop kicks Jericho out of an aerial attack, he hits a nice looking head scissors and a one foot stomp from the top rope. Everything's coming up Daz Wunderkind until Chris hits a lion salt. It's only a 2 count but Chris gets up, he hits a jumping back kick, he catches Wright in the corner before slamming him down and he locks in the lion tamer. Chris Jericho wins on Monday Nitro. It wasn't a 5 star classic but when you add in Alex Wright dance moves it instantly becomes a classic. Harlem Heat take on the Steiner brothers next on Nitro while the WWF put on a Godwins vs LOD match. On Shotgun Saturday night back in April, Henry Godwin cracked his C7 vertebrae after taking a doomsday device. He said he was advised to take 15 weeks off but he ended up coming back way sooner. 
He's got a new attitude where he kind of bullies Phineas around. He wants revenge on Hawk and Animal, and he doesn't get it either because LOD wins the match, meaning Hawk and Animal continue in the WWF Tag Team Tournament. They fucked up the ending too, I'm not sure what they were planning here, but it certainly wasn't this. Animal nearly got his back crushed by Big Henry. After the bout, the Godwins lay the Road Warriors out with the slop bucket, and then the Heart Foundation attack the Road Warriors, while Brett watches on from the entranceway. Remember, Hawk and Animal are going to take part in the Canadian Stampede 10-man tag. Hawk and Animal get destroyed, Brett gives his boys a high five, and then we see retired boxer Tommy Hitman Hearns in the audience. We'll be seeing Hearns again a little later in the telecast. Hardham Heat vs The Steiners at this point is a match I think we've seen too many times on Reliving the War. Not that there's anything wrong with that, they're two of the best tag teams ever after all, but we should put focus on other guys who haven't been covered all that much, and besides, this was not their best match. Look at the Bulldog that ended the bout for example. A few things to note. 1. Sister Sherry got knocked off the apron by Booker T. This ultimately led to Harlem Heat getting defeated. And 2. Stevie Ray performed a chin lock. Nice. Look at this too, I thought this was interesting. The cameraman's hyping up the audience. The Steiners end up winning and so they're the undisputed number one contenders. Buff Bagwell and Scott Norton come out afterwards and Bagwell shows Scotty Steiner what a real set of arms looks like, before saying the Steiners may be number one contenders but there's a new team in town. And that new team is vicious and delicious. Looks like Scott gets a little offended when Buff says his arms are going through atrophy, so we assume there's going to be a rivalry now between Vicious and Delicious and the Steiners. This is a good thing. As mentioned, the Harlem Heat vs Steiners matches were becoming a little too frequent. Hector Garza takes on Viano 4 on Nitro, while ECW Sabu takes on Flash Funk on Raw. A few short promos and ads on Raw before the match though. Paul Bear and The Undertaker are seen in the locker room, Paul once again interrupts The Undertaker, and this pisses the dead man off. Vader tries to save Paul, but he too gets grabbed by the throat. Paul says, remember the fire? And this makes Taker release Bear and Vader and the WWF Champion walks away. Vader and Taker are going to team up tonight to face the Nation of Domination by the way. Owen Hart's got a triple threat match later and he isn't happy. Not only does he have to face two Americans and Goldust and Triple H, but he doesn't have to get pinned or submitted to lose his IC Championship. Owen says though he has a surprise in store that will secure him a victory. We then get a quick advertisement for Steve Austin's Cause Stone Cold Said So VHS tape. Austin says if you want to see guys dancing with sparklers going off then this isn't the video for you. And Flash Funk cuts a pre-match promo and Funk calls himself one of the best high flyers of all time. Tonight it's time for he and Sabu to crash and burn and see who the best really is. Old Scorpio had some wide eyes during this promo, scary shit. So Sabu, the last time we looked at a Sabu match was back in episode 8 of Reliving the War. Sabu vs Disco Inferno on Nitro. He did show up during the ECW Invasion episode of Raw 2 though. Paulie dangerously is back at the commentary table and Sabu starts it off with a springboard heel kick. Flash falls out of the ring and Sabu hits a somersault plancha. He then tries to grab a table with the help of Bill Alfonso but Flash throws Sabu back into the ring and he pulls off a, a twisting corner clothesline. Yeah let's go with that. Funk then pulls off a nice top rope splash where he changes direction in midair. He goes upstairs again but Sabu catches him and we see a springboard hurricane rana from the top. Sabu then pulls off another springboard kick that looked good but he goes to the well one too many times and Flash Funk levels his opponent with a super kick. Sabu stops Flash from performing another aerial move but he pays for it by getting crotched on the top rope and Flash hits a diving clothesline. Flash Funk then pulls off a sweet handspring kick and he pulls off a plancha. The hits keep coming back in the ring with a moonsault from Funk and Sabu replies with a hurricane rana from the ring to the outside. And then Sabu grabs the table once again. The referee calls for the bell but that's not going to stop the homicidal, suicidal, genocidal Sabu. What will stop Sabu though is that table not breaking. He tries three times and it doesn't break. God damn it. Still an awesome TV match though and a breath of fresh air to Raw's war. When you watch this shit weekly, twice in your lifetime, then these kind of matches become a welcome change.
WCW advertises their website, the show Eric Bischoff doesn't want you to see comes live to the internet. Either it's a scandalous video of Eric partaking in dirty deeds done dirt cheap, or it's an episode of WWF Raw, a 2022 episode of Raw. Mike Tenay introduces a video highlighting the mad skills of one Ernest the Cat Miller, but before we check that out, check out this guy. It's like a weird Jim Duggan and Arn Anderson crossbreed, Arn Dugginson. I like how our guy here is already giving Ernest a mighty thumbs down as he smiles and says, fuck this shit. So here's Ernest Miller, he's in the gym working out, and here's Joe Corley, president of the Karate Association, and this is supposed to impress us. Old Joe puts Miller over big time, but here's the thing. If I want to learn about karate credentials, if I want to learn about the speed, the moves, the impressive kicks of a karate expert, you know what I would do? I'd fucking watch karate and not watch WCW Nitro. Imagine that, karate bios, where I upload videos to YouTube featuring the greatest karate fighters in the world, including Ernest Miller, Johnny Lawrence, Cyberfist, The Green Power Ranger, and Chuck Norris. Anyway, Ernest Miller wrestles later tonight. That should be fun. Hector Garza vs Viano 4? It wasn't good. WCW didn't care too much, seeing as these guys didn't even get entrances. I think Garza's corkscrew moonsault knocked him loopy for a second. That's a rough looking headbutt right there, folks. And Garza got the win with a standing moonsault. Nothing to see here, just move on. Bulldog vs Mankind on Raw, giant package promo on Nitro. Mankind comes down to the ring wearing a Steve Austin shirt and a sign around his neck that says, Pick me, Steve. He dedicates his match to Steve Austin too, so clearly Mick still wants to be Stone Cold's tag team partner. Okay, but that's not the important news here. Guys, Davey finally breaks the habit during this very match on Raw. No, he doesn't give up the sniff, don't be silly, but he does give up the chin locks. That's right, a one on one singles match with Davy Boy Smith where no chin locks are applied. While I'm bummed out that we won't see a Davy Boy Smith chin lock, I'm also glad he got himself clean and he's moving on with his life, so good for you, Davy. Here's a little celebratory explosion. Oh shit, Davy Boy Smith is chin lock free. One day at a time, Davy, one day at a time. Steve Austin phones in, he says he's been injured but he plans on getting back in the ring later in the week on house shows. He gives a shout out to his brother who got stepped on by a bull, not because Austin's worried about his health but because his brother owes him $30 and he needs to get back to work. And as for Mankind, Austin thinks Foley is a kind man for wearing his shirt but Stone Cold still doesn't want help from this freak. Shawn Michaels is Stone Cold's tag team partner and even though Austin doesn't know what's up with Shawn, he still plans on tagging up with HBK during the finale of this tag team tournament. Mankind and Davey go over the top rope and Bulldog grabs his knee. Our lord and saviour was just playing possum though, because he gets right back up and he hits Mankind with a clothesline. Foley then gets thrown into the ring steps and Mankind gets suplexed on the rampway. Notice how Davey doesn't go down with Mankind, he's too smart for that nonsense. Back in the ring, Davey tries to end it but Mankind counters the power slam with the mandible claw. Bulldog gets out with a low blow, he then gets himself disqualified by using a steel chair. There's two brutal chair shots to the head here, showing us that Mr Smith can do some serious damage when he stays off the chin locks. Davey shows off his big sexy arms and this, ladies and gentlemen, was a mistake, because surprise motherfucker have a mandible claw. Davey gets out of the ring and Vince McMahon says if Austin wants a tough tag team partner, there's no one tougher than Mick Foley. The Giant and Lex Luger cut a promo on Nitro. Lex says he and the Giant were sickened by what happened last week. WCW officials have given Team Giant Package their word that extra security will get added to Bash at the Beach, so there's a level playing field in the tag team main event. Getting knocked out and spray painted last week was an embarrassment for Luger and the Giant, but they're going to use the beatdown as an incentive for revenge at the pay per view. The Giant says he's lucky. He's the one who's going to choke slam the worm at Bash at the Beach. He's going to play a game at the pay per view. He's going to see how many times he can slap Hogan and Rodman before their hair dye comes out. Very good, big man, very good. Luger says it's an old cliche, but it's true. Team Giant Package will do their talking in the ring on July 13th. Owen Hart defends his IC title next in a triple threat match while Nitro puts on two matches. Six vs Chavo Guerrero and Steve McMichael vs Conan. 
Owen argues backstage that Hunter and Goldust are allowed to bring their managers and bodyguards to the ring, so the King of Hearts wants Brian Pillman in his corner tonight. Gorilla Monsoon agrees, and so here it is. This was the very first triple threat match that ever took place on WWF TV, though they did happen at house shows. Pat Patterson referees the match, and it's fascinating seeing how triple threat matches started in the World Wrestling Federation. Of course, ECW and WCW were doing these kind of matches, but this was a first for Vince McMahon's company. They really play up to the fact that the champion could lose the belt without getting pinned, and the commentators take time, maybe too much time, to explain how a triple threat match works and the overall disadvantages it puts the competitors in. It certainly doesn't flow too well, and you can tell the guys weren't used to these matches yet. Nearly every pin attempt is broken up by another guy, which really isn't necessary. And all three stay in the ring too long, whereas one guy should have spent a little time on the outside at different points in the match. Still, it's interesting to watch. Hunter thinks he and Owen are going to work together, but Owen hits a spinning wheel kick on the King of the Ring. Goldust then hits the curtain call on Owen. Owen gets pinned and Pat counts to three. Only problem here is Owen having his foot on the bottom rope. Pillman jumps into the ring to protest the outcome. Earl Hebner runs down to say the wrong decision was made. And during the break, Gorilla Monsoon makes Patterson watch a replay. The match is then restarted, and the fans get treated to a China Hurricane Rana when Owen and Hunter fought on the outside. This gets a great reaction from the audience. It ends with the one hitting Triple H with an enziguri. Goldust tries to break the pin with an aerial attack, but Owen moves out of the way. Pillman then stops Goldust from breaking the follow-up cover, and Owen Hart officially wins the first televised WWF Triple Threat match. On Nitro, Chavo surprises Six with a head scissors, Waltman takes a moment on the outside before getting back in the ring, Guerrero hits a flying punch, but he tries an aerial attack and he fails to hit his target. Six hits a nice spinning back kick and he hits Chavo with a jumping back kick in the corner, and Scott Hall talks a little shit while Guerrero gets choked with Six's boot. Hall then holds Chavo in place for a Bronco Buster, looks like the bad guy's having a lot of fun tonight, and there's a chin lock from Six, by god someone has to do it. Waltman hits a Mishinoku driver, but he fails to land another Bronco Buster in the corner. Chavo tries to steal a victory next with a roll up, but Six kicks out, and then Eddie shows up on the entranceway just like last week. The match goes to the outside where Chavo builds a comeback, he gets back in the ring, and Scott Hall hits Chavo with an outsider's edge while the referee was distracted by Six. You'd look over this if it was a super kick or some sort of finisher that's really fast, but come on, how does a referee not notice this? Eddie looks disappointed at this turn of events, Six applies the buzz kill, and Six retains the cruiserweight belt. Mongo and Conan had a match afterwards, and look at this. Boyfriend. Has girlfriend who enjoys the four horsemen. Smug VIP fan standing next to her, licking his lips, telling us all at home that it won't be her boyfriend who conducts horseman business tonight. Oh no. This match was supposed to happen a few weeks back, but Hugh Morris jumped Conan and Kevin Green jumped Mongo. As for Double J, he's on horseman probation, apparently. No WCW appearances, no hitting the town with Slick Rick, and no late night visits to Deborah's dungeon. Conan tries to out Mongo Mongo with a three point stance, but sure, that didn't work, did it? Big Steve O does some damage, and Conan decides football offense isn't gonna work, so he gets in the ring and he lays in the punches and a few chops instead. Conan wrenches on Mongo's neck, he hits his rolling clothesline, but then Hugh Morris causes a distraction and Conan takes a tombstone pile driver. One, two, three, Mongo wins another one. McMichael vs. Jared is gonna happen at Bash at the Beach, and the US title will be on the line. The Battle of the Horsemen continues on, unfortunately, but in better news, the whole Jared vs. Mongo thing is coming to an end soon. Also, does anyone actually care about Conan vs. Hugh Morris? The hitman Bret Hart cuts a promo next on Raw, while Roddy Piper and Ric Flair cut a promo on Nitro. So, the jam. <laughs> that shirt has been far and away the most successful shirt on the store, and a big thank you to everyone who purchased one. I get loads of pictures and tweets with you guys showing how you've got the jam, but Pete right here, Pete's a heck of a guy, a serious professional, a jam up guy. Here he is giving a lesson about staying away from that lousy stinking hyena Steve Austin while wearing his jam shirt. 
Honestly, this made me laugh so much when I saw it. Thanks, Pete, and thanks to everyone who grabbed the shirt. If you can think of creative ways to show off your chinlocks.com merch, send me it over, and with your permission, I'll put your pictures on Reliving the War. Can't wait to see someone sitting in an igloo with a frosty bald shirt on. Anyway, enough shelling. Bret Hart says it's gonna be a Canadian stampede at in your house. The Hitman says the Legion of Doom aren't the greatest tag team in the history of the WWF. That honor belongs to Bret and Jim Neidhart. The Hitman says Ken Shamrock is fresh from the Ultimate Fairy Championships and he wants to make a name for himself in the World Wrestling Federation. As for Goldust and Marlena, Bret has four sisters who'll beat the shit out of Marlena if she touches the British Bulldog again. And Stone Cold Steve Austin, he's the scum of the earth and the Heart Foundation are gonna pound Austin into dust in Calgary. Bret says Team America won't steal victories in the Canadian Stampede. And speaking of thieves, Brett heard there's some dude in the audience calling himself the Hitman. Vince McMahon points out Tommy Hitman Hearns and boy does he look pissed off. Brett says there's room for only one Hitman and seeing as Tommy stole the name, then the former 7 time world boxing champion can step into the ring with the excellence of execution. So does Hearns have the jam to get in the ring with Brett? Fucking right he does, Tommy storms the ring when Brett calls him the chicken man. Brett takes off his jacket for a fight. The anvil tries to get between the two men, but he ends up taking a few body shots, and then the ring fills up with officials and whatnot to stop this fight from happening. The audience loves this. Tommy tries to get at Brett, but he can't. Anvil's all dazed and confused, and the hearts decide to leave the ring, and Tommy goes back to his seat. So, yes, Tommy Hitman Hearns most certainly has the jam. On Nitro, the Roddy Piper and Ric Flair saga continues. Roddy says he's been too much of a goody two-shoes recently, he's been running on unleaded, but now he's gonna run on pure Nitro. Wordplay from Roddy Piper, guys. Piper says he wants to clear some rumors about the Great American Bash. He says slamboree, but he meant the Great American Bash. I thought this was sorted out last week, but apparently not. Out comes Ric Flair, the Nature Boy says Piper's his friend and he'll always stand by his side. Flair says he chased six away from the ring at the pay-per-view because it was in Piper's best interests and it was in Flair's best interests. Piper doesn't know how it benefited the hot rod at all and neither do I. Flair brings up the fact that Piper wasn't around in the weeks leading up to the Great American Bash. Piper was too busy floating around the Caribbean with Jenny McCarthy and I called bullshit on that one. Benoit, Deborah, and Mongo come out and Mongo insults Piper for wearing a skirt. Piper says he didn't come to Nitro to get insulted. Mongo says he won't let anyone mess with the team captain. Flair wants to end the promo and get Piper out of the ring. But Piper says he won't let anyone push him around like that. Flair needs to control his faction. Benoit insults Piper too, so the hot rod loses it and the horsemen get floored. Ric Flair has no choice. He goes to attack Piper, but Roddy blocks it and Flair gets taken out. Piper tries to fight the horseman, but the magical briefcase proves to be the ultimate game changer once again, and Roddy finds himself locked in the crossface. Flair then begins attacking Piper, and my my, look at this, the horseman being the horseman once again. It's about time this happened. Officials hit the ring to break it up, and hopefully we get to see more of this in the weeks that follow. Scott Taylor vs Brian Christopher on Raw, Glacier and Ernest Miller vs High Voltage on Nitro. So the battle of too cool before they were too cool. This one is once again billed as a light heavyweight match, and it's good to see Brian Christopher get another match on Raw. Jerry Lawler brings Brian to the ring. The King says there's better wrestlers from better organizations than ECW who could get showcased on Raw, and that's why he's with Christopher tonight. Brian hits a German suplex, but he misses an elbow drop. He quickly recovers with a Famouser, and then Jim Ross brings up the fact that Brian is Jerry's son. King denies it, saying that people shouldn't believe what Paul Heyman says. Christopher hits a dropkick to the back of Taylor's head. Scott eventually comes back with a springboard clothesline. Christopher hits a second rope scorpion death drop. The King continues to deflect statements that Brian Christopher is his son, and Brian wins the match with a top rope leg drop. When Jim Ross and Vince McMahon won't stop talking about Christopher being related to Jerry, the King threatens to reveal Jim Ross's phone number live on Raw. Over on Nitro, Ernest Miller is about to make his WCW Nitro debut, and I asked you guys to come up with a tag team name for Miller and Glacier. And let's see what we've got this time. Uh, 
jobbers on ice, frozen furries, blue balls, earnest pair of frosty balls, burr and burr. <laughs> Oh, frosty claws, a catastrophe, somebody cool my mama, somebody call my thermometer, okay. Two guys, one snow cone, who and why, Mortal Kombat rejection, Mortal Bobcat, Mortal Kombat annihilation, the game, the chiller and the miller, the helmetless helmets, Daniel LaRusso fan club, I don't know but whatever game they're from is on the Atari Jaguar. The Bozo Dojo, Miller Ice, Miller Light, Miller Shite, The Amazing Frosty Feet Turnbuckle Humpers, Frostbite, Frozen Dead Cat, <laughs> what? The Who Knew It Would Only Take 25 Years To Get Over Guys, Black Ice, Somebody Thaw My Mama, Wrath and Mortis's Punching Bags, The Bastards, I Don't Care, I Just Want My Answer On Reliving The War, Ernest Goes To Outworld, Loads of people suggested cool cats, but I'm gonna go with Ice Ice Maybe with the baseline. Never in my life have I wanted high voltage to win a match so bad. The lads attack Glacier and the cat right away, but a few fancy kicks from Ice Ice Maybe and high voltage gets sent out of the ring. We end up with Glacier and Kenny Chaos. Chaos goes for a sunset flip. And Robbie Rage lends a hand with a springboard bulldog. Take that, Frosty Balls. Rage gets tagged in and he mocks the cat by doing the crane kick pose. Mortis and Wrath stand at the entranceway looking all fucking awesome as Rage misses a springboard senton. Loads of springboard moves tonight on Reliving the War. Ernest gets tagged in and fucking springboard kick. The cat shows off his sick footwork with some honestly good looking kicks. Chaos tries to break up a cover but Glacier nails him with a cryonic kick. Glacier then sweeps Rage and Miller pulls off this sweet looking top rope spin kick to get the win. Mortis and Wrath then run down the ringside but they put the brakes on when Ice Ice maybe show they aren't to be fucked with. Miller was good, nothing was botched and I'm genuinely interested in seeing more of his work. But Glacier's his best mate so fuck Ernest Miller. We end this week's Reliving the War with D'Lo and Farouk taking on The Undertaker and Vader, and we've got Scott Hall vs Diamond Dallas Page on Nitro. Alright, so let's take bets. Who thinks the Nitro match will end with a clean finish and who thinks we're going to see some sort of disqualification or run in? Scott Hall comes out and he points to the entranceway, Randy Savage and Liz walk out. So if you think this match is going to have a clean finish, then you need to go all the way back to Reliving the War Episode 1 and start this series all over again. It's okay, we'll all wait here for you. Dallas sends Kimberly to the back, not wanting her to get into any harm. The crowd chants We Want Sting and Scott Hall's like, nah, he ain't here tonight Chico. Hall throws the toothpick, Dallas slaps him in the mouth. Scott kicks Dallas in the midsection and Scott works over the wrist and arm. Paige gets up and he too focuses on wrist control but Scott remembers the injured ribs and Paige goes down after a few strikes. The bad ribs become the target but Paige comes back with an inverted atomic drop and Hall's cell job afterwards is absolutely wonderful. Paige ends up getting thrown out of the ring where Savage gets in a cheap shot. Hall then goes on offense and Dallas takes a hard bump at the ring steps. Back inside the ring, it's more shots to the ribs. Paige goes for a backdrop but he ends up getting his face slammed to the mat. Randy Savage continues to get in cheap shots when possible but Paige keeps fighting back. He counters a suplex with an armbar takedown and when Hall tries to unravel Paige's bandages, the bad guy takes a clothesline. Dallas then signals for the diamond cutter and Savage hits the ring to cause the DQ. Paige then gets destroyed by Macho Man and Hall and then the stinger shows up. Sting stands in the audience and he points the bat, warning Macho Man not to hit the elbow drop. Savage decides to do it anyway and so Sting makes his way down to the ring and he protects DDP from any further harm while Hall and Savage think about what they're gonna do next. Sting waits for the NWO's next move. Macho and Scott decide to go on the attack but Sting takes out both guys with his baseball bat and then, in typical WCW Nitro fashion, the show goes off the air. Vince McMahon wants to know what Paul Bear meant when he said remember the fire earlier on but Paul's keeping his lips sealed, he says everything is under control. So this is the final first round match of the tag team tournament. Vader and Taker formed this unlikely tag team due to Paul Bearer, 
and right at the opening bell they're already having words. You wonder why Ahmed Johnson isn't in this match, that would make a whole lot more sense than Delo being in there. No offence to Delo, of course. But Ahmed hurt his knee during the Dirty Ol Assholes brawl earlier in the evening and man, the timing couldn't be any worse for Ahmed. Finally getting the title shot, the promo we cut before getting injured about not getting an opportunity, and he's back on the shelf once again, that's some real bad luck. Taker's completely in control at the beginning of the match and Dino's getting a chance to wrestle one of the greats pretty early in his WWF career. He gets to do a little damage when he attacks the Undertaker's midsection and here comes the DOA to ruin the party. The Nation and the DOA brawl on the outside just before Raw goes to break. Vader and Undertaker have words again before the WWF champ steps out of the ring and he starts attacking anything that moves. We come back and we've got Dilo and Vader in the ring, and Dilo makes the mistake of throwing punches at the big man. That, of course, doesn't last long. Vader goes up for a Vader bomb and he hits it. Farouk runs in to break the count as The Undertaker seems too busy arguing with Paul Bearer. And then Farouk gets tagged in. Ron Simmons and Vader have some history, but none of that gets brought up. Farouk catches Vader and he hits a great looking power slam. Dilo comes back in while Paul Bearer continues to talk shit to the dead man. Vader seems to be doing just fine on his own as he hits a splash, but he gets fed up with The Undertaker and he decides to push the dead man. Taker punches his tag team partner, and this allows Farouk to nail a clothesline and score the pinfall win. Taker doesn't seem too bothered afterwards. He goes to leave the ring, but Bearer orders Vader to attack. The dead man takes care of Vader with a big boot and a tombstone pile driver, and just as the Phenom was about to leave the arena, Paul Bearer says next week, the secret is gonna get revealed. Looks like Paul has had enough of Taker's nonsense and he's gonna spill the beans next week. The Undertaker again doesn't seem too worried. He sends a message that Paul's days are now numbered. Two good shows this week and once again I couldn't choose a winner. I went to the score sheets for the head to heads and I've got it down as a draw here too. So I'm calling this week's episode a tie. On Raw, the triple threat match was interesting, the nation evolving was good to see too, although the DOA stuff, it's not really for me. And the Sabu match stood out too as something different. Nitro's main event was good, but the finish, as always, lets it down. Ernest Miller had a brief but fun debut, and Six vs Chavo was good too. Six is becoming an unsung hero of the NWO really, he's having some of the best bouts out of the whole faction. We now have 12 ties on the board after this week's episodes of Raw and Nitro. In the television ratings, Nitro scored another 3.3, Raw scored a 2.4. No movement from either show. Next week on Nitro, the Impact player is revealed, the well-known superstar who's been teased for a few weeks now. We've got a Kevin Nash vs Rey Mysterio matchup, and Hulk Hogan addresses that big stinky giant and flexy Lexi. On Raw, we've got Ken Shamrock vs Triple H, Steve Austin vs Jim Neidhart, and Paul Bearer reveals the dark secret about The Undertaker's past. Thank you so much for watching Reliving the War, I hope you enjoyed this one, and take care.